Hey, this is Rob there. We're, we're back on the record. All right. Well, as I indicated earlier, I wanted to uh, try to find a way to make a contemporaneous decision regarding all the matters in front of the court here today. And let me share with you the primary reason for that is because I do find that um, the public, the Nevada public, has a, uh, an important interest in the result of uh, legal activity such as this having to do with the election. And so I don't want to belabor that decision um, because uh, the public's uh, the public interest means a lot to me as a judge. In addition to that, uh, given the timeline as between now and November 3rd, uh, I want to make a decision so that uh, any party who uh, wants to have per further court activity by way of the appellate courts would have, at least conceivably, an opportunity to do that. And then also, uh, stylistically in me, mm -hmm. and that really comes from all the years of lawyering <clears throat> and being in front of the Nevada Supreme Court a lot, you know, all that and in my professional life. Uh, when there's a number of issues in front of the court, uh, as I've seen the Supreme Court do oftentimes, in the event that the decision uh, might uh, be finalized having to do with one of maybe five issues, uh, I've seen um, courts and I've seen the appellate courts uh, make findings in the alternative. Uh, that way, all the issues that were brought to the court's attention uh, have certain findings related to them. And you're not left hanging on any of the issues. Uh, and that way the record will be uh, complete, having to do with all the mainline legal issues uh, that are important to people in the case. So it's my intention to do that as well. So, uh, with all that said, uh, here's the uh, decision. Uh, and, um, you know, I want to tell you something that my guess is uh, your son would tell you as well, and that is uh, you've done a good job in your own uh, way of bringing forth uh, a number of important and interesting legal issues and a case on behalf of a client. Um, you know, I've had you in court before, and I can tell you, I know, again, I think your son would say, well, there he goes again. Um, and I, I appreciate, that's my way of saying to you, that I appreciate uh, your zealousness, your argument, your dogged determination to bring this to a, to a court. And um, so I want you to know I do feel that sincerely. And um, given what I said, too, about the potentiality of further appellate review, um, I'm, I'm trying to find a way to respect that, uh, you know, I'm just one judge. And um, uh, I, uh, of course, always try to do the best I can in this job. Um, but I understand that reasonable minds could differ. And you're going to see, for example, when I start this decision, that reasonable minds as between me and federal judge Miranda do might differ to some extent. And, and that um, can happen as amongst judges um, from time to time. All right. So let me go ahead and give you the bottom line uh, decision on everything here. And so here we go. The uh, first area I'd like to cover is whether the plaintiffs have standing. And I, again, reference let me that share with you the primary reality here now, you'll see the reality that uh, federal judge Miranda, do and I may disagree on this point. An argument could probably be made we really don't disagree in some ways because she has to apply a federal standard and I have to apply a state law standard. And so, uh, let me answer the question as to do the plaintiffs have standing? I think it's a close call, as will be some of the other issues here. But I'm going to find that, that the plaintiffs in this case do have standing. Uh, and I take that by applying the standard uh, that comes to us in state law. Let's see here. 
uh, the Swartz versus Lopez case from 2016. In that case, um, the uh, Nevada Supreme Court indicated that the question of standing concerns whether the party seeking relief has a sufficient interest in the litigation. Um, as you all, I think, correctly referred to this, there's a public importance exception in the law. And um, so the Swartz court talks about the idea that, of course, generally a party must show a personal injury and not merely a general interest that is common to all members of the public. Well, if that were the end of this standard, well, then I would find the opposite. But the Supreme Court in that case goes on to say there's an exception to this injury requirement, you know, this uh, uh, specific injury requirement, when cases involve issues of significant public importance. Uh, and there, um, be that becomes the public importance exception. And uh, again, though it's a close call, um, I'm going to find that the three factors under Swartz uh, establish standing. And so here's my findings in regard to that. I think the first prong of the three-part test under Swartz is easy. A case must involve an issue of significant public importance. Um, and I think the plaintiffs clearly and strongly and overwhelmingly uh, need that factor because, again, um, well, I mean, my name's on that ballot. So uh, I can tell you um, elected officials uh, respect what the uh, Nevada citizens do by way of voting. Uh, um, and it's certainly a very important public issue, uh, voting in general and addressing voting in conjunction with a pandemic. So uh, that factor, again, is overwhelmingly met on the standing front. <clears throat> um, I'm gonna skip to the third factor just briefly Plaintiff has to be an appropriate party. No one else in a better position to bring action. Plaintiff is capable, capable of fully advocating their position in court. Well, um, as I tried to compliment Mr. Hansen and his uh, zealousness on behalf of his client, consistent with that is the idea I do believe that, and I'll find that uh, uh, the plaintiff is certainly, uh, the entity plaintiff is the Election Integrity Project of Nevada LLC is certainly um, in a position to advocate the Let me answer the question as to having to do, do the plaintiff's have important stand. matters, of course, having to do with the election in conjunction with the pandemic that the Nevada legislature had to grapple with. The, uh, I think the point, though, uh, that would probably be reasonably disagreed upon by other state court judges even, I would say. I mean, chances of all 32 of us saying the exact same thing on this are probably not good, but you're in Department 32. And I think that the second factor under Swartz is met, although I'm telling you um, that it's close. The second factor for standing then is case, the case must involve a challenge to the legislative expenditure um, or appropriation on the basis that it violates a specific provision of the Constitution. I think it's questionable as to whether the plaintiffs meet that prong, as it's questionable that AB4 uh, actually has a legislative expenditure um, in that sense. But I'm going to uh, give plaintiffs uh, uh, a finding on that that um, I think there's a good enough argument that, in fact, uh, AB4 does present a legislative expenditure in that it does call for something that otherwise we wouldn't have, and that is the expense associated with the mailing, putting the ballots out in the mail and all that. We saw numbers thrown around in here. There was a dispute about a $2 million number, a $3 million number, and um, actually, I think it's possible that when Secretary of State Zagofsky uh, uh, made the comments uh, at one point in time having to do with, uh, let's go ahead and uh, have in-person voting in November, uh, my guess is uh, that probably goes right to what I'm talking about, the idea that there's a certain expense. Uh, it could be that, that comment by the Secretary of State 
uh, was based upon concerns about the uh, financing and the government's ability, especially in light of a, of a pandemic, to um, find a way to finance uh, a, uh, a mail-in vote. And so I, the court cannot take exception with the fact that the Secretary of State may have said that. Um, frankly, reasonably so, at least as far as uh, the budget is concerned. Again, at a time where, uh, you know, I can probably take judicial notice of um, a lot of uh, loss of jobs, loss of revenue, casinos being shut down. Um, and so I think any sort of comment by the Secretary of State that uh, uh, we may have to have in-person voting or have in-person voting or something consistent with whatever she did say, uh, I certainly can respect that there's a budget a monetary concern uh, that um, she might have enunciated. But nonetheless, that seems to be highly relevant to the idea that, uh, and maybe the Secretary of State's uh, comment could be seen as a concern about AB4 being a legislative expenditure of sorts, certainly relevant to that. So with all that, um, I'm going to find that the three prongs of the Schwartz versus Lopez standing test are met, that there's a public importance exception. Uh, to the extent it's a balancing test, and I'm not sure it's actually that much of a balancing test between these factors. They seem to be independent. But to the extent uh, there's any balancing to be done, the first factor farly outweighs any else. appropriation on the basis of the violates. public issue that uh, uh, has to be reconciled. So the plaintiffs uh, prevail on standing. That takes me to the next issue, and that has to do with a legal concept known as ripeness. The uh, Nevada Supreme Court uh, has talked about ripeness in a number of cases. Uh, going back to the Resnick case in 1988, the idea of uh, actual justiciable controversy uh, to uh, allow a judge to afford judicial relief. In other words, and this is a long established, uh, at least legal philosophy, the idea that courts, judges, you know, guys like me, um, ought to involve themselves in matters where there's an existing controversy, not merely the prospect of a future problem. Um, and then more recently, in a case called Herbst Gaming versus Heller in 2006, again, and the Nevada Supreme Court uh, refined or defined or clarified or told us more specifically about the law in this area um, and um, talked about factors to be weighed. Uh, so there's certainly a balancing test when it comes to ripeness. Um, the hardship to the parties of withholding judicial review, the suitability of the issues for review. Uh, comes from the Herbst case. But more specifically, I think there's something that comes out of that case that becomes um, uh, perhaps, at least in my mind anyway, one of the more important aspects of it. And that is uh, where the court says, and this is talking to me because I'm the one doing this right now, a primary focus in such cases has been the degree to which the harm alleged by the party seeking review is sufficiently concrete rather than remote or hypothetical to yield a justiciable controversy. And I, I have to say, again, all these decisions are never easy. Um, I make them to the best of my ability. But it is based upon that idea that is the law. You know, as a district judge, uh, when there's uh, authority uh, from the Nevada Supreme Court, uh, whether as an individual person or judge I disagree or agree, whatever it may be, doesn't matter. I always follow it no matter what it is. So uh, when the Supreme Court says in Herbst, sufficiently concrete, the remote or hypothetical, um, I have to say, and you'll see this theme come up uh, more when I talk about, for example, the injunction standard. It is my view um, that... Um, despite some of the, uh, and really a lot of the things that uh, Mr. Hansen brings up, I am going to make a finding that the uh, concerns, though uh, well taken um, as to 
ballot harvesting, um, signature problems, uh, or even the uh, three-day rule, which I'll talk about some more later. Um, I do not feel as though there's evidence in front of the court to demonstrate that this is a sufficiently concrete um, uh, concern, uh, and rather it's a good argument, but it's I think it still is hypothetical. And so I'm going to find that as to ripeness, the plaintiffs failed to meet legal ripeness in this case. Um, but I did say that I wouldn't leave you hanging. I mean, I guess the judge could simply say the plaintiffs failed to meet ripeness. Have a nice afternoon. I don't want to do that. Uh, what I'm going to do is say if there is ripeness, so I found there's not, that then takes us to some other areas I like to cover. And uh, the next one, I think, has to be, um, well, I'm going to, in my notes here, this idea of uh, uh, an unfunded mandate comes up in here. Um, yeah, NRS 354.599 comes up. Um, the, there is a case in Nevada, by the way. Let me see if I can find it. Um, there's a case, North Lake Tahoe uh, Fire Protection District versus Washoe County Commissioners from 2013. Um, and I'm using that case for some guidance here on this uh, unfunded mandate issue. Uh, and it really gets to whether this unfunded mandate issue, this idea that, you know, the general legislature in AB4 did what they did, but then the true practical impact, and this is my words for it, you know, the pr true pa practical impact um, is in the various counties because every county has to figure out a way to uh, let people vote. So this unfunded mandate argument um, presents the issue of whether this is a, uh, as far as the uh, budget allocation issue and what have you, to actually have every county do what they're going to do to have polling places. Be one in this county, two in that county, a hundred in Clark County, whatever it may be. Uh, the uh, North Lake Tahoe case talks about the idea of whether there's a, something known as a political question. There's a political question doctrine. Uh, the idea there is it, if it's a political question, then it's non justiciable. Um, and uh, uh, as I see that body of law, um, and I might be uh, describing it in a philosophical sense rather than a specific one right now. But as I see it, it's, it, it brings up a question that's an important one for a judge. And that, you know, judges shouldn't involve themselves in political questions. What's a political question? A political question would be if a judge decides uh, to do something that another branch of government rightly so should be doing. And in other words, um, in my view, it's up to the legislature, both the state legislature and the local governmental bodies, to figure out how to have uh, adequate amount of in-person voting um, in the various counties. Uh, to me, that's a legislative function. And it's not for me as a judge to tell the county officials, especially, uh, how to do this. Um, I, you know, I really think that here in Clark County, that's up to the registrar and the officials here. Uh, and so I think it's a political question. Uh, so that item that came up in here, the unfunded mandate uh, argument, um, I think is a political question. It's best left to the legislature to figure out how to have bold voting places in the various counties, given AB4 uh, in reaction to the pandemic. And it's not for me as a judge to tell them how to do their business in that regard. It's a legislative function. So that means it's a political question, and I stay out. All right. Uh, it came up, and I think I do agree in the alternative in any event on that point. I agree with Ms. Khanna that uh, I don't think there's a private right of action when it comes to that specific unfunded mandate area. North Lake That's Tahoe. probably, again, because I think it's a legislative function more than a judicial one. Okay, um, that takes me to 
the injunction standard is probably the best thing for me to handle next, leaving the ultimate constitutional issue for the end. Um, all right, so in Nevada, of course, we all know that uh, given that there's an injunction asked for here, the question is, can the plaintiffs show a likelihood of success on the merits and in balancing the harms, a reasonable probability that uh, essentially if I allow this, the Secretary of State to continue, uh, that'll cause irreparable harm. Um, and so I have to make that the findings on that, uh, uh, that test, uh, the injunctive test. And I'll incorporate by reference what I said before. I have to say that uh, uh, I do not find that the uh, plaintiffs have a likelihood of success on the merits, and I also find that the plaintiffs do not have a reasonable probability that if the Secretary of State or the government or the state of Nevada, the election officials continue, that that's going to cause an irreparable harm. And, and here's what I mean by that. If you look intently um, at the body of law having to do uh, with this injunction standard, um, and um, you apply it uh, specifically to our situation in court here today. It's my view that um, the plaintiffs, uh, though I think they raise points that are decent points that any human being would have concern with. I mean, you know, if there's a bunch of ballots laying around some apartment complex or on the floor as suggested, um, yeah, that's not good. A picture of that. As an elected official, if I saw that photograph of a bunch of ballots laying around, you know, laying around the condominium mail room or something, that would definitely cause me concern. I wouldn't like to see that. Um, you know, this idea of the ballot harvesting that I think flows from that, uh, um, and a number of other things brought up in here. Um, but I have to say that, uh, in my view, those concerns show something here, and that is that. I don't think anybody could expect that this is going to be perfect. Um, you know, at the end of the day, uh, and this is not a Democratic issue, it's not a Republican issue, it's none of that. Um, it's a total nonpartisan point I'm going to make here. I don't care who's in charge. It just happened to be whoever's in charge and who's in the legislature when this pandemic hit. Well, they're the ones that have to deal with it. Um, and so it's not a party specific thing whatsoever. But the point of it all is, at least in my mind, is we have to, I think, and courts and I have to consider to some extent that, you know, our elected officials, you know, it's kind of like when I was in the Army, you know. Uh, I was, uh, in 1989, uh, on December 20th, 1989, actually, I was sitting at my desk as a lawyer. Um, uh, I was a captain in the United States Army JAG Corps, and uh, next thing I knew, I was at Travis Air Force Base on a C-5, going to Panama, where I then stayed for about three months in a jungle. I didn't know that was going to happen that day. Arms, a reasonable problem. I did my best, uh, just like we all did. To deal with it, uh, you know, I really think it's the same way with the legislature in a lot of ways. It's not going to be perfect, but I think they have they, all the members of the legislature, the executive branch, uh, you know, have to figure out a way to deal with the fact that there's a pandemic. I mean, you know, we all have these, and. We have to live with it until, hopefully, God willing, we get a shot in the arm, hopefully by the end of the year. But the fact of it is, um, it's not going to be perfect, but is there evidence of tangible, non-speculative harm that's really going to happen, especially in light of the fact that, you know, if somebody goes over that apartment complex and gathers up those ballots and sends them in and signs them, it's a felony. Uh, and I would hope that if someone does that, they get caught and they're, you know, prosecuted for it, certainly. So, uh, you know, I respect the concerns. I mean, I don't think anybody likes, and I think everybody has to admit, you know, of course there's concerns. Um, but as to the harm, 
I think it um, under the law, you, the problem is the burden that the plaintiffs have, in my view, can't be met to show success on the merits or uh, that it's going to cause irreparable harm, reasonable probability of irreparable harm, if the government officials continue uh, with what uh, they've come up with to try to deal again with the pandemic and the fact that there's an election coming up. Uh, so uh, in, in conjunction with this injunctive standard, that this is a good uh, place for me to mention the postmark issue that I asked questions about and came up uh, in the hearing. And I have to say it was very helpful to me because I was concerned. Um, about this three-day rule, but it was helpful to me, uh, Mr. Zanino, and, um, you know, even to Mr. Hansen's credit, you know, he's an honest guy, I think. He said, well, you know, it's wonderful uh, that uh, most of these uh, uh, pre-marked, uh, post-paid ballots uh, would be actually postmarked. That'd be wonderful. But I have to tell you, um, I, I'll accept that there is a protocol um, that has been described by Mr. Zanino, and that helps me um, feel a little more comfortable about this um, uh, postmark issue. Uh, my thought is if the post office does postmark all these ballots, even though they're prepaid, um, that, as Mr. Hansen even said, that would be wonderful. Um, um, but I also want to say that um, it, even notwithstanding this postmark issue, I think it's a close call, but, you know, the question is, uh, and this gets to the final issue, the ultimate constitutionality of AB4, um, you know, given the pandemic, uh, I think that the legal standard has to be did the uh, government, did the legislature act? They all have these um, rationally. Um, they don't have to act perfectly, but they have to act rationally um, to deal with um, the unfortunate spot that they get put in. Um, and uh, I think that's the standard. You know, they have to act rationally. So um, you're going to see when I. Uh, reconcile the ultimate constitutional issue, of course, consistent with a lot of things I've said here. I think the Nevada legislature did act rationally, not maybe perfectly, but ra rationally. And that's that's important because as a judge in a court, you know, you always have to figure out what's the legal standard to be applied to your situation. If the legal standard were they have to act perfectly, and this can be a zero tolerance, well, I don't think anybody could meet that, and chances are we would have a legal problem. But I don't think that, I mean, I'm sure that's not the standard. The question is, do they act rationally uh, in light of a pandemic to try to protect um, the uh, health, safety, and welfare of medicine? And I think they did um, under these circumstances. And even that three-day rule, the, like I say, the postmark issue gave me a sense of comfort but even without the postmark issue that Mr. Zanino has filled me in on, uh, I see in other states come up, Wisconsin, New York, I think have gotten to it, uh, you know, as fate would have it quicker than some of the other sister states. But in any event, uh, you know, I, I'm not going to say that this is irrational. It's not perfect given my, you know, dinner table voting on November 4th, and it gets there by the 5th. I get that. But that's not the question for me. I think the question has to be, is it a, is it a rational, is it rationally related to the government's interest in trying to reconcile the fact that there's a pandemic and, uh, you know, uh, we have to deal with it in light of the fact that there's also an election uh, that normally, um, uh, over the years, of course, in Nevada, um, requires or would allow for in-person participation. So um, there's that. And then the last thing, then, of course, is the ultimate uh, um, uh, constitutional issue. I know a lot of the things I said already, of course, would deal with the constitutional issue anyway. But um, there's a more specific constitutional challenge here. 
Uh, and that has to do with equal protection, uh, Article 4, Section 21 of the Nevada Constitution. Um, well, I, I guess no surprise, given that I've already said that I think that the uh, uh, legislature acted rationally under the legal standard here. Um, that um, I also have to say that AB 4 uh, is not unconstitutional, as again, uh, there's evidence, and it's clear from the face uh, of AB 4 that they're acting rationally. Um, and um, so, um, uh, let's see, um, it's section, I think section 8 and then the parenthesis 2 um, says, uh, with a lot of things I've the governor or legislature can declare a state of an emergency or declaration of disaster under NRS 414.070. Um, and it goes on to, to talk about, of course, the idea of health, safety, and welfare. Then in section 10, parenthesis 1, um, the AB4 talks about the purpose uh, is to protect public health, safety, and welfare and ensure that every eligible person who is registered to vote, every voter who wants to vote, may do so safely and securely. Well, you know, that, that was a heck of a, I think, um, onerous task uh, for anyone to have to involve themselves with. Um, but it's clear from the face of AB4 that the Nevada legislature certainly wanted to do the best they could to protect public health, safety, and welfare. Um, and that's what I have here. One last thing, and that is this idea of equal protection. I, I saw it in here sort of as a county to county argument in addition to everything else. Um, and uh, to me, um, there's not an equal protection concern county to county in Nevada, as I think there's a rational relation test passed there as well in that each county um, based upon population. I mean, if it's based upon population and you have 100 or more individual polling sites in Clark County, but in some other county where my wife and I like to take our Jeep once in a while, you only have one or two, well, as long as it's based on population, that to me that is rationally related to a government interest. So for all those reasons, um, I'm going to deny the uh, uh, request for injunctive activity, deny the uh, challenge to the constitutionality of AB4, uh, and other than finding uh, standing, uh, pretty much deny every other request that were, was brought to my attention. Although, again, um, I appreciate the effort at making rec the record and bringing forth things to court on something that is important. But all that, of course, means, Mr. Zanino, I'd like for you to uh, draft the order of the court, run it by Ms. Khanna, and then run it by Mr. Hansen and all, everybody else involved um, and um, submit it to the court. I'll review it, and it'd be, but it would be very helpful if you do that. Um, so um, I think that's it, and everybody have a good day.